I'm Selma Schimmel, and we are at the Milan, Italy meeting of the European Society for Medical Oncology meeting. It's the 35th annual meeting, and we are having the opportunity to visit with and talk to some of the lead presenters at this meeting, and one of them is joining us now. It is Dr. Tim Perrin, who comes to us from St. James University Hospital in Leeds, UK, United Kingdom. Hello, how are you? I'm very well, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm really thrilled that you're with us because I had an opportunity as I was reading through the presentations and I saw ovarian cancer. And as one of the challenging cancers that women face, anytime I see any information there, I think it's very important to sit down and, and, and talk about what's what's in the pipeline, what's available, what are the new studies, and you have been working on one that's quite important, and that's what we want to talk about. Dr. Perrin, you are presenting uh, data at this meeting about your own research involving ovarian cancer. Will you tell us something about it? Thank you very much. Yes, I'm presenting data from a, a study that we call the ICON-7 study. It's a study that investigated the addition of a new drug, a drug called Bevacizumab, sometimes known as Avastin, which is its trade name. And we're investigating Pevacuzumab added to standard chemotherapy for ovarian cancer in a randomized clinical trial. So we've recruited 1,528 patients into the trial. Is this uh, the 1,500 plus patients, are they from all regions? Are they all European or is this an international study? It's an, it's an international study run by the Gynecological Cancer Intergroup. So we've got centers from Canada and Australia, Scandinavia, from mainland Europe, from the United Kingdom. So we've, so we've got seven of the Gynecological Cancer Intergroup study groups represented in our, in our clinical trial. So the patients who entered uh, our trial were allocated to receive either standard chemotherapy, which is with two drugs called carboplatin and paclitaxel, or standard chemotherapy plus the new drug bevacizumab. The standard chemotherapy for ovarian cancer is six cycles of carboplatin and paclitaxel chemotherapy, one cycle given every three weeks, and then no further treatment, and the patients remain under follow-up. Patients recruited into the clinical trial, half of them were treated in the standard way. The other half received bevacizumab with their chemotherapy treatment, and then for 12 cycles of treatment beyond the end of their bevacizumab treatment. So they receive concurrent bevacizumab with chemotherapy and maintenance bevacizumab after the end of chemotherapy. So they had 12 months of treatment in total. What stage of disease are these patients eligible for the trial? That's an important question. Um, we tried to make our trial representative of the whole population of patients with ovarian cancer. So we recruited patients into the trial who would be receiving chemotherapy as part of their treatment in any case. So we recruited 10% of our patients who got early stage disease, so disease that was, had been confined to the ovary or had spread but just to the pelvis. And for those early stage patients, they had high risk factors. So they had a grade three cancer or maybe they had a clear cell cancer. And those are factors that predict for a higher chance of recurrence. So those patients would routinely receive chemotherapy as part of their management. But in addition to that, we recruited patients with more advanced disease. In fact, three quarters of our patients had got um, disease where there was a significant amount of residual disease left after they'd had their primary surgical treatment and that disease had spread into the upper abdomen so we call that stage three or spread beyond the abdomen in which is called the case it's called stage four so three quarters just below three quarters had advanced stage disease 10 percent had very early stage disease but with high risk factors and the remainder had were in between what can you report now on the outcome of the study thus far? Well, the primary endpoint of, of the study uh, was progression-free survival. So we were measuring the time it took between starting the chemotherapy and the disease recurring or the patient dying. And 
what we demonstrated was that patients who received the bevacizumab had a lower risk of developing recurrent disease than the patients who didn't receive bevacizumab treatment. And the Avastin, the marketing name, was given uh, it along with the chemotherapy from the very first treatment? The Avastin was given with the chemotherapy from the first treatment if the patients were fit enough to receive it. Uh, Avastin or Bevacizumab is an interesting drug. It's not a chemotherapy drug. It works by inhibiting a substance called vascular endothelial growth factor. And vascular endothelial growth factor, we sometimes call it VEGF, is responsible for the development of new blood vessels around a tumour. And obviously cancers can't spread and they can't develop, they can't grow unless they develop a new blood supply. So the theory behind bevacizumab is that if you attack the blood supply at the same time as you attack the cancer cells, you may have a bigger effect against the, the cancer. But obviously if you're attacking blood vessels, you might be attacking the blood vessels that are responsible for wound healing. So we had to wait until the patient's wounds had healed properly. And we did that by, for most patients, they started their chemotherapy about a month after the, the surgery. But for some patients where it was necessary because they had very aggressive disease or had got a lot of disease left after surgery, they were allowed to start their chemotherapy earlier than that, in which case we didn't give the bevacizumab, the Avastin, with the first course of treatment. So what is the, the, the outcome and do you see that Avastin is going to play an important role in association with the other drugs currently being used? Well, Avastin definitely delayed the development of progression of ovarian cancer. Within the, within the study that we did, we, short, we saw an effect that built up over time. So the peak effect was at about 12 months, when 15% less patients had developed recurrent disease than patients in the control arm of the study who had not received the bevacizumab. But after 12 months, the, 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 the difference became smaller uh, again over time. Now, because we had a relatively good risk patient population, not all of our patients have got very advanced disease, our survival of our, our progression-free survival uh, of our patients for the control group was about 18 months. For the patients who'd received Avastin, it was increased from uh, 18 months to, actually it was 17.3 months to, to 19 months. But what happened was that because the curves, the curves diverge, they, they move apart and then they start coming together again. They were already starting to come together at the point on the graph, which we call the median progression-free survival, which is the point at which half of the patients have mm -hmm. developed progressive mm -hmm. disease. They were starting to come together at that point, so that the difference between the curves was not at its greatest. And that's because we've got a large population of patients with relatively low risk disease who have not yet developed recurrence. So only 50% of our patients have developed recurrent disease at this stage. Is this going to be now ongoing? Are you going to continue following these patients? Yes, the patients are going to be followed up and clearly the key, the key fact is not does Avastin delay progression of ovarian mm -hmm. cancer, but does Avastin result in improved survival for patients with ovarian cancer? Which would be our great help. Yeah, it would be a great help. I mean, clearly survival is the, is the gold standard. Um, at the moment, we don't have enough survival events to have a robust measure of whether uh, Avastin, whether Bevacizumab does improve survival uh, or not. We'll have that data in about 2012, so in about another two years. Until then, I think our data remain preliminary and will wait to be confirmed. Having said that, the data that we are we're describing, we're presenting from the ICON-7 study complements the data that had been presented earlier in the year at the ASCO meeting by Berger and, uh, and his group from, um, from the gynecological oncology group, mm -hmm. where they'd done a similar study, but they'd done their study in patients with much more advanced disease. So their patients have got a much poorer prognosis. The median progression-free survival in the GOG study was only 10 months, whereas ours was nearly 18 months. 
So when they look at their outcomes, they measure a much bigger difference between the curves.